Thank you. Good afternoon. The Senate Committee on Natural Resources will now come to order. Members and presenters, please remember to mute your microphone when you are not speaking. At this time, will our secretary please proceed to call the roll? Senator Brooks. Here. Senator Goikachia. Here. Senator Hansen. Here. Senator Scheibel. Here. Chair Donate. And I am here. Thank you for calling the roll. We have met the quorum. Welcome everyone to the Senate Committee on Natural Resources. Before we begin, I would like to go ahead and explain to you all how our, how our virtual committee meetings will work, since this is a new process for a lot of us during this session. As you know, the legislative building is currently closed to the public, so all committee meetings will be held virtually, meaning committee members, staff, and everyone else will participate either through Zoom video conference or by telephone. However, there are various ways that members of the public can engage with us and participate throughout the entire process. As in previous sessions, all committee-related information is available on NELIS, which is accessible from the legislature's website. There are four main ways that you can engage with my committee, including registering to participate in a committee meeting through the new system or NELIS, which places you in line to testify for our bill or provide public comment, submitting written testimony to the committee's email address, sharing your opinion via the legislature's opinion application on NELIS, or viewing committee meetings online through NELIS or on the legislature's YouTube channel. To testify on a bill or provide public comment during the 2021 legislative session, members of the public must first register for the meeting that you would like to participate in. Committee meetings are listed in several places on NELIS. To register, simply click on the participate button near the meeting date and time, and then fill out the required information. Once your registration is submitted, you will see a confirmation screen, and you will also receive an email and a phone number and a meeting ID to call at the time of the meeting. Just as a note, while the meeting registration is required to participate, it does not guarantee you a space to speak. And similar to previous sessions, testimony and public comment may be limited due to time constraints. When you are on the phone line, please pay attention to which bill is being considered when the bills are listed on the meeting's agenda and follow the verbal prompts provided by BPS so that you know which keys to press and raise your hand to unmute yourself. Senate bills 63 and 98 on the, are on the agenda today in addition to a presentation by Carson Water Conservancy District. BPS staff will call on you to speak by the last three digits of your phone number and detailed instructions on participating in committee meetings are also available on the help page, which can be found on every top page of on Nellis. And if you ever need any assistance with any of these processes, or if you'd like to have uh, to receive electronic notification of the committee's agendas and minutes, always feel free to please contact our committee manager at the committee email listed above. So with that, um, we are ready to proceed. Um, give me one second. At this time, um, we are ready to go ahead and proceed with our first bill hearing. I will now open the hearing on SB 63. Um, and actually, uh, I'm going to change plans. Let's go ahead and um, considering we have a few presentations, I'm going to see if we can move and do those first. So at this time, what we're going to come back to. Uh, Senate Bill 63, but at this time, let's go ahead and move with our presentation. So right now we will have an overview presentation of the Carson Water Conservancy District um, before hearing a bill related to the district. Mr. Ed James, uh, General Manager of the district, please begin when you are ready, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, I'm going to, whoops. Let me see what happened there. Try this again. Well, we'll go right to the second slide. Um, so for the record, I'm Ed James with the Carson Water Subconservancy District, and I'm gonna give you an overview of the Carson Water Subconservancy District. But before I do, I wanna talk a little bit about the Carson Watershed. 
Um, the Carson watershed starts in Alpine County. There are two forks, the East and West Fork, and they flow down into Douglas County and come together at Genoa and then continue to flow on to Carson City. From Carson City, it water continues to flow into Lyon County. I will point out that there's a little bit of Story County that is in the watershed. They do not touch the river itself, but they do have a participation in the watershed. The water then continues to flow down into the Lahontan Reservoir. It's one of the first Bureau of Reclamation projects that was built that provides irrigation to uh, Churchill County in the lower part. The Carson watershed is about just under 4,000 square miles. The river flows about 184 miles. The elevation fluctuates from a low of 3,000 in Churchill County to the Sierras, which is over 11,000 feet. The precipitation varies quite a bit. In Churchill County, it is around four inches per year, continues to go get greater as you move west up the watershed and in the Sierras, we can get over 40 inches of precipitation. There is very limited upstream storage on the Carson. So really, we really depend on mother nature every year for our supply. If there's a good wet year, like in 2017, we have plenty of water, but years like this, which looks a little drought, it can be short on flows. The river is fully appropriated. That means that all the water is fully allocated, even in dry average or wet years. It is only in extreme years that there is any excess water available. I should also point out that all the groundwater basins are fully appropriated. The one unique thing about the Carson is the Truckee Canal. The Truckee Canal was part of the Newlands project and it's bringing water over from the Truckee River through this canal into Lahontan Reservoir. It's part of the Newlands project. This is a critical element of the overall Newlands project because they realized when they built it that the Carson cannot provide the full amount of irrigation water needed for the Newlands in average or dry years. Only in wet years is there enough water that comes down the Carson. So I would give you an example of how important this Truckee Canal is. This year from October 1st forward, over 70% of the water stored in Lahontan today has come from the Truckee River. So a little history on CWSD. In the 1950s, US Congress established what they called the Washoe Project. And this was to look at building upstream storage on the Carson and Truckee watersheds. Now, what these were projects were there for agricultural purposes. And when the federal government builds these projects, they wanna make sure that the, they are paid back through the farmers. But the federal government does not deal directly with the farmers, so they create a agency that goes between. And so in 1958, they created the, what they call the Carson Truckee Water Conservancy District. And it was made up of representatives from all the counties in both the Carson and Truckee drainages. However, in 1959, it became very clear that the Carson needed its own board. And that's why they created the Carson Water Subconservancy District. And that's why they call us the Subconservancy, even though we had our own board. And the idea was to negotiate the payback on the debt for the Washima Dam between the ranchers and the federal government. And at that time, it was Douglas and Lyon County were members. In the 1980, the federal government abandoned the dam project on the Carson. And then in 1989, the Nevada legislature changed CWSD's purpose to look focusing more on water resources for the region, realizing that again, all the water has been allocated. How are you going to be able to meet the new growth and demands in the watershed? And at that time, Carson City was became a member of Carson Water Subconservancy. In 1997, there was a major flood that impacted most of the counties in Northern Nevada. And in 1998, the group of people got together, over 100 people in the Carson, to talk about how they wanted to deal with water issues. Did they want to create a flood authority dealing with water resources and how to do it? And the overwhelming support was to create an integrated water process that basically not just have one agency, but bring everyone together because everyone realized it's not gonna be one entity that could deal with these issues. 
And from that, the Carson River Coalition was formed, and I'll talk briefly later on a little more about that. And they asked the Carson Water Subconservancy District if they would administer this process. In 1999, Churchill County became a member. And in 2001, Alpine County, which is in California, became a member of CWSD through a joint powers agreement. And in 2018, Story County became an advisory member. So a little bit on the Carson River Coalition. This is made up of large stakeholders of federal, state, government, tribal agencies, non-governmental, private, and landowners. And basically is bringing all these people together. Brenda Hunt and Shane Fryer in our um, organization are the main people who help coordinate this effort with all these different parties. So the structure of CWSD. We currently have 13 board members and one advisory member, which kind of represents the six counties and two states. Our fundings come from the property tax and grants. All the counties in the watershed, except for Story County, financially participate with CWSD. Even Alpine County participates. And years ago, when they first joined, we calculated what their cost would be equivalent to all the other counties, and they pay us through their general fund. We also get several grants to help fund a lot of our projects. Our average budget is between $2 million and $2.5 million, depending on how much grant funds we receive. Uh, one of the other thing important is that CWSD has no regulatory authority. So anything that we come up with has to be brought back to the counties to implement. And this is kind of the checks and balances in the watershed. Um, we only have five members on staff, two are full-time and three are part-time. But you can see by our expertise, we have a breath, a breath of knowledge. So what do we do? Carson Water Subconservancy District's mission is to promote cooperative action across agencies and political boundaries in the Carson River watershed using an integrated watershed management plan. We, do know, we no longer just focus on water supply, but we look at all the water resource demands in the watershed. So I want to briefly go over our integrated planning process that we use in the Carson. Starting off with water quality, uh, we work quite a bit with NDP, but with also communities to look at water quality sampling. Uh, we do a lot of work with the USGS for groundwater sampling and also groundwater monitoring. Um, basis species, that's a huge impact on our agricultural communities. We also have a lot of federal lands that have a lot of noxious weeds. So we work with our partners to start dealing with noxious weeds. Recreation is another critical element. Um, there's a lot of nice hiking, mountain biking in the community, but just three miles from the capital is some great whitewater rafting on the Carson and also some flat water that just takes a bit. However, it's only runnable when mother nature provides us the water. We also work with our partners on river restoration projects. Back in the late 1800s, they used to cut down trees in Alpine County, put them on the East Fork of the Carson, and then when the water was up, they would then run them down the river into Carson City, and they, were, they would be milled and sent over to the Comstock. Excuse me, Mr. James. Yes. I hate to interrupt your meeting, but this is broadcast. We okay. cannot see your presentation to the public. So although you guys are seeing it, the public is not. So if there's any way you could stop your screen share and come back into it, you can continue from that slide, but we'd like the public to be able to see. It. I apologize, I'm sorry. I thought that oh, was. You're good, thank you. Okay, let's see if this will work. Is that seeable now? We are double checking, please stand by. Yes, okay. we can see it now. Thank you. Please okay, continue. thank you. Sorry. So because of the uh, past actions, we have had an impact on our river channels. In fact, in the 1960s, the Corps of Engineers came through and straightened several of the reaches along the Carson to try to eliminate some of the flooding issues. What this happened caused was the water was moving faster and now caused more erosion on banks. And you can see from this picture, some of the impacts of erosion so we do provide a lot of funding to the conservation districts that are working on to try to repair our river channels itself. 
Part of it also is our outreach to the community. We realize that by getting kids involved with the watershed, they can then run out and teach their parents what they need to do. And so we do a lot of work with our partners going to schools, uh, not this year, but in the past, we've actually gone into classrooms. We also bring kids out to the river. And so we do quite a bit of work with our partners to educate. In fact, I have a slide here showing one of our um, projects that we participated with one of the schools. You can see here we're showing the flood model. And you might recognize two of the people on the right hand of the slide who we're looking at the time we were presenting. So with our flood projects, we handle our flood management a little different than our neighbors to the north on the Truckee or in Clark County. What the community wanted to do was avoid getting into a structural design of the water system and focus more on using the natural resources of our watershed and basically allowing the floodwaters to access its floodplain. And so this is how we deal with our flooding. We found out from multiple studies that if you allow the area to flood in the floodplains, it's a far cheaper way of dealing with your flooding than what you're dealing with when you do a structural analysis or process. It's also environmentally more sensitive to it and it helps habitat and also recharges our aquifer. So part of our planning process is we did a regional floodplain management plan. We worked with all the communities up and down the watershed, and this plan was then adopted by all the counties in the watershed. Another thing that we've been very active on is in 2005, CWSD became what we call FEMA Technical Partner, Cooperative Partner, or CTP. And this allows us to get federal funds from FEMA to do flood risk analysis, to minimize flood hazards, and also to do flood studies. Since 2011, CWSD has received over four and a half million dollars from FEMA on these projects. The other thing, of course, is looking at water supply and demands. We are doing a lot of work with the communities to look sure that, make sure that we have a sustainable water supply for all the water agencies. There are 11 major water provider, purveyors in the Carson. And we also look at infrastructure connections to help move water through that is more cost effective than everyone doing on their own. A couple recognitions of CWSD in 1920. CWSD was awarded the 2020 Golden Pinecone Sustainability Award from Green Nevada. So recognizing our sustainability efforts that we are doing in the Carson watershed. And in 1920, CWSD was selected the Floodplain Manager of the Year from the Floodplain Management Association for California, Nevada, Hawaii region. This is kind of a big, um, recognition since you figure the hundreds of different water flood agencies that there are in California, Nevada, Hawaii, but they do recognize the work that we are doing. Just last week, I found out that we have been recently nominated by FEMA Region 9 to be the technical cooperative partner for 2021 nationally. Now, we're competing with all other 50 states in the country, and again, many of these have four or five times the staff and huge budgets compared to what we do. But a guy kind of recognizes that CWSD is doing something right as we're dealing with flood issues in the watershed. One of the things I really want to talk about is balancing the water supplies. Any study that we do looks at the impact on these others. I always tell people our water supply is like a three-legged stool. If we take from one it's gonna impact the others. We will no longer have a level stool. So it's real important that when we do our studies that we look at, if we're gonna provide water to new growth, how can we balance that to make sure that we're not adversely affecting our agriculture or environment? And these are critical elements in our planning process. One of the things we found out years ago when we did a survey is that over 70% of the population in the Carson watershed did not know that they live in a watershed or what is a watershed. And we realize if we're gonna start promoting, protecting the watershed and getting people involved, it's important that they understand that they live in a watershed. If they don't understand that, then we're kind of missing the point. 
So I want to show you a quick little video that we created, basically of walking through the watershed and making people aware that, they're, that they live in a watershed. Hello. Did you know that you live in a watershed? Everyone does. Join me for a one-of-a-kind walk through the amazing lands that shed water to the Carson River and discover why watersheds are important for the health of our communities. Let's start up at the top high in the Sierra. Snow accumulates here and melts throughout the spring and summer, supplying water to the two forks of the Carson River. A flycaster's dream, the West Fork flows through the beautiful meadows of Hope Valley, while the East Fork rushes from the iceberg wilderness, creating a whitewater rafters paradise. Both floodplain and meadows act like large sponges, soaking up spring runoff, capturing floodwaters, filtering pollutants, and recharging groundwater, our main source of drinking water. Near historic Genoa, the two forks of the river meet in the large floodplain of the Carson Valley. Here, the river's water is the lifeblood of the ranching and farming communities. While most rivers flow to the ocean, the Carson River flows through desert canyons and cottonwood galleries, terminating here in the Carson Sink. Smaller creeks from the surrounding ranges also contribute water to the Carson River. As rain, snow melt, or irrigation runs off the land, it can pick up pollutants as it travels towards the river. This polluted runoff is the number one impact to water quality in our watershed. Clean water is critical to grow our food, to replenish our groundwater, and to play in the water safely. We're launching the I Am Carson River Watershed Campaign to ask our community to do a few simple things. By picking up your trash and pet waste, draining your rain gutters into your yard, recycling your motor oil, and by washing your vehicle at the car wash, you can keep pollutants out of our waterways. So, whether you're dying to hang out in Virginia City, hiking Carson Valley's trails, swaying to the music in Carson City, boating on Lahontan Reservoir, sampling Churchill's finest, or birding at the Stillwater Wildlife Refuge, your actions matter. I am Carson River Watershed, and you are too. Let's all do our part to keep our families and our watershed healthy. So, Mr. Chairman, that is all I have. I'm open for any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. James, for that presentation. Um, just for clarification purposes for anyone that's watching this right now from the public, um, we did have some technical difficulties with the video. So uh, the link to the video and the earlier slides that were not shown to the public, uh, you can find this actually on the exhibits um, on today's committee meeting agenda. So. If you go on Nellis, you can click on exhibits and then you will find the uh, presentation that was just delivered. So with that um, and that clarification, um, do any of my committee members have any questions for Mr. James regarding this presentation? Again, this is separate from the bill that we're about to hear. So if you have any questions, now would be the time. No? Let me just double check. Okay, I think we're good. Thank you, Mr. James. Uh, Thank you for your time. So in this case, uh, let's go ahead and proceed with the next bill. So at this time, I will now open the hearing on SB 98. This measure makes various changes to provisions relating to the Carson Water Subconservancy District. Uh, Mr. James, will you please proceed when you are ready? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe Senator Settermeyer was going to introduce this bill first, so I would turn that over to him, please. Of course. Uh, Senator Settermeyer, whenever you're ready, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to present Senate Bill 98. My name is Senator Settermeyer, James Settermeyer. I'm the representative of all of Douglas County, all of Lyon County, all of Story County, and all of Churchill County. Now, if we just add Carson City to that, we basically have the impetus of the Carson Water Self Conservancy District, which also includes actually a member on it from Alpine County as representative. Because as we know, water does not really know the concept of county lines or state lines. Instead, it tends to much more focus, as mentioned earlier in the presentation, on the concept of a river 
watershed, and that's what we're discussing, the Carson River watershed. And the counties in these areas in the uh, northern part of the state understand the importance of that and therefore have been happily members of the Carson Water Self-Conservancy District, which seeks to, of course, look at everything from floodplain management, invasive species, outreach education, recreation, regional water supply, and river projects, whether that be even, uh, most certainly, they help work on the Marlette water system, which I recommend that everyone look at. It is a fascinating project that dates back to the Comstock era that actually helped convey water from Marlette Lake through gravity flow siphon system to Story County. And in that respect, that's what we're discussing today. The concept of allowing Story County, who wishes to become and is currently actually a member in an advisory capacity only to the Carson Water Subconservancy District, they wish and have come forward and wish to be members of the Carson Water Subconservancy District, understanding full well that they have to pay to be part of and to participate and to tax their residents In effect, and that's in one of the, uh, and so that would add that to 2021, adding two members from said Story County appointed by the Board of County Commissioners. And then, of course, the taxing authority is on number five. It's fairly simple in that respect. And if anyone wishes to see more of the presentation or that previous YouTube, they can also go to cwsd.org. Again, that is a Carson Watershed District webpage, so cwsd.org. So in that respect, Mr. Chairman, I feel it's fairly simple in that respect. If there is such a thing as a simple bill, and I probably just jinxed everything by saying that, uh, in that respect, I would gladly be willing to take questions, or if Mr. James wishes to correct me on anything, that's always a good thing as well. Uh, thank you, Senator Settlemeyer, for that presentation. Uh, Mr. James, would you like to add anything, or are we ready to proceed with questions? I just want to clarify one thing is that Story County has asked that this not be on their tax roll, that they are going to fund this through their general fund. The uh, right. calculation would be the same as every all the other counties at three cents per hundred, but it will actually just come out of their general fund. Thank you, sir. Uh, let's go ahead and proceed with questions from the members. The first one I see is Senator Gordichia. Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and uh, Andrew James. Uh, the reason that Story County is in fact paying this from their general fund is that because there's truly, I, I thought I heard uh, Mr. James say, there truly isn't any water rights on the Carson in Story County, is that right? For the record, Ed James, the Carson Water Sub Conservancy District, uh, really has nothing to do with water rights on the Carson. It was more of their service area the total funds, I believe, that would come out of Story County was about $16,000. And I believe that they felt that they had enough funds in their general fund to cover this cost. And they did not want to put another tax on their customers. But I believe Austin, um, um, the county Osborne. manager, is going to participate and answer any questions you have at that time. I'm fine with that. I just thought maybe it was a case of didn't want to pose the, impose the three cents uh, because there wasn't any actual beneficial use, i.e. per say water. I appreciate this. this is Senator Settlemeyer. I think there's also a, a thing, if you look at the map, you look at the actual land mass that's within Story County. However, that water that drains into the Carson Water Subconservancy District, the other water that is served by the Marlette Lake system goes into Story County and benefits other areas that may not directly drain within to the Carson Water Subconservancy District. At least that is my opinion. If Mr. Osborne does, happens to be on the phone, he might be able to clarify that. But my understanding that I forgot about is that Ed James had indicated that, uh, I'm not Ed James, as Ed indicated, the county felt that the amount of funds that were necessary was easier just to pay out of their general fund rather than to look at doing any type of an assessment. Thank you. Uh, great, thank you for that clarification. Uh, do, does any other committee members have any questions? Senator Hansen, go for it. Senator Hansen, you're still on mute. Thank you, sorry about that. Uh, quick question, number one, historically Story County got most of their water from 
uh, Marlin Lake, didn't they? Uh, uh, are they actually going to start taking a draw off of the Carson City, uh, uh, off the Carson River? Uh, just out of curiosity, or, and do they currently use Carson River water on, on you know the Dayton area where the boundaries of Story and uh, the other counties meet? I'm more kind of curious why why now after all these years and years do they want to be part of, part of this Carson City uh, uh, drainage issue? This is Senator Settlemeyer for the record. It is my understanding, which again, I, I hope that Austin Osborne might be available to answer this question, but if you look at the Carson Water Subconservancy District, the cwsd.org website, you can see how the CWSD helped assist in the Marlette Lake water system redevelopment. And that does benefit Story County. And I think that, you know, reasonably they looked at it and realized that they were acquiring a benefit and they have certain portions of their county that drain into the Carson Water Subconservancy District. So no, to my knowledge, in any way, shape or form, they're not looking to draw water directly out of the Carson River, just, you know, uh, out of the Carson River. However, they understand that they have water that drains into it and that they are getting water from Marlette Lake, which is again, part of the Carson Water uh, drainage system or the Carson River watershed. Now, is there still a giant siphon I, like they had back in the Comstock days? It's still there, huh? Fascinating, really. All right. Well, anyway, uh, I look forward to hearing uh, from the other folks on that. I'm just more, more of a curiosity and kind of a historical question. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Hansen. Uh, any other questions before proceeding? Okay. Seeing none. Um, oh, Senator Brooks. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, uh, my, my curiosity has now been piqued by uh, the Marlette water system uh, uh, comment. What, what is the interaction between uh, the, the Carson River Conservancy di uh, District and the um, Subconservancy District and the Marlette system? What's the, the interaction there and the relationship? I don't know, if Mr. James or Senator Settlemeyer, if, if, if you could uh, answer that. This is Senator Settlemeyer. I'll let Mr. James take a stab at it. Like I said, the best thing to me is to go to their website and you can actually see the video where they help with some of the funds to help out with the upkeep of the system. Because uh, as you know, the system is rather old and requires some funds to be put into it and also some technical stuff. So, but I'll let Ed James uh, have a stab at it first. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. For the record, Ed James. Um, our involvement with the Marlette system happened years ago. Um, historically, when the state would uh, pump water to out of the Marlette Lake, they had this huge diesel pump and motor and they had to haul diesel and it really did not fit with the environmental um, view that you wanted on Marlette Lake. There was also concerns of diesel spills and all that. So CWSD got involved. Um, we met with the EPA and we actually were able to get a grant to look at getting rid of the diesel pump. And we do have a video on CWSD. If you're ever interested in seeing that, you could see it really does not fit with the environment. And we got some funding to help be able to bring water using a natural gas and generator to uh, bring water over the mountains from Marlette into the um, Hobart drainage area. Now, historically what happened was the water was run through flumes out of Marlott Lake. And that's why if you've ever been on the Flume Trail, the bike, that was the old original way of bringing water out of Marlott Lake through a flume and into a tunnel that they dug um, back in the late 1800s and brought water around that way. And then all by gravity, it would flow in. However, the, uh, the tunnel collapsed in the uh, 50s and 60s, 1950s and 60s. And there was really no way to economically reactivate that tunnel. And so the idea of state in the 60s put in a pump and a pipe overlaying the ground, and we just upgraded that system to be more environmentally friendly and more reliable system years ago. I will also point out that a lot of the work that we're doing with Story County is probably more with flooding than with water supply. Um, they have a lot of issues with drainage and with the money we can get from the FEMA, we can do a lot of work with them. And so that's really kind of what's drawing this. Also, any water that comes off um, Virginia City and flowing down that way goes through Lyon County. And so there's been impacts between the two counties with floodwaters. 
And so we're also dealing with the noxious weeds. Um, we've been spending a lot of money trying to deal with noxious weeds. But the problem is if you don't deal with them in Alpine County, or I'm sorry, Restoria County, they keep coming into Lyon County. And so, again, this cooperation through multiple county jurisdictions helps us deal with these uh, other issues in the watershed besides just water supply. Thank you, Mr. James and Senator Settlemeyer for that clarification. Uh, any other last minute questions before we proceed? Uh, Chair, can I follow up real quick? Go for it. Isn't the Marlette system completely outside of the Carson River system, uh, the uh, sub-conservancy district? That is correct. It's um, in Truckee, or actually the Tahoe, Tahoe drainage. But Carson City gets quite a bit of their water from uh, the Marlette system. In fact, for years, the state had its own water, separate water system, separate from the state, uh, from Carson City. And they would actually bring water from the Marlette over into the state uh, facilities and also provide water to Carson City. And that's how we got involved, again, to upgrade this system. Um, even though it's not in our watershed, the water was delivered into this watershed. And again, the concerns when you talk about the fisheries and everything up at Marlette Lake, there was a concern by the community to see how we could bring water in a more, more reliable manner and also more environmental, environmentally friendly manner. And, and Chair, if I can just have one last question. Is, is it some sort of a like interlocal type of agreement or some sort of a, or is it just kind of the board decides that what actions would be helpful to the Marlette system and then they, they work with the Marlette system? Or is there some sort of a contractual agreement of some sort? It was more of a, for the record, Ed James, Carson Water Sub Conservancy. It was an opportunity at the time. We were able to get um, the U.S. Senator staff up to the Marlette back in the early 2000s and show her the, you know, what was existing up there and the concerns we saw on the fisheries. Uh, we had a lot of state agencies working with us. Uh, we just happened to be the lead agency when we got the money from the EPA to do some of the repairs on it. But the whole thing was to enhance the whole overall water system and help the reliability. Um, we tend to work where we're asked to work and provide assistance. CWST actually did help provide some funding for that project, but most of it came from Carson City who purchased the water and from the EPA grant that we received. Thank you, Mr. James. Uh, Senator Gokichia, do you have another question, sir? I thought maybe I might be able to help clarify Mr. Uh, Senator Brooks's question. I believe it is appropriated water and it is brought over the hill through an interbasin transfer. Uh, you know, it's interbasin transfer. I believe, Mr. James, I think that's really where uh, Senator Brooks is headed. Thank you, Senator. That's, yeah, that, that explains it for me. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Uh, do I see any other last minute questions? Seeing none, uh, thank you, Mr. James and Senator Settlemeyer for your presentation. At this time, we will go ahead and move with testimony. So as a reminder, we will be limiting all testifiers to two minutes each. Testifiers are encouraged to summarize their positions and submit more comprehensive testimony in writing. BPS, is there anyone on the line who would wish to provide support testimony for SB 98? Thank you, Chair. To testify in support on Senate Bill 98, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 693. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. This is Austin Osborne, Story County Manager. Am I on? Yes, yes sir, please proceed. 
Okay, thank you. <clears throat> this is Austin Osbury, Story County Manager. I was slated to speak at this. Uh, I had some unmuting issues. Uh, I will go ahead and give my presentation. Uh, I'm representing Story County, and I'm honored, uh, Senator Don today, or Dante, uh, for letting me speak. Um, Story County has been cooperating with the Carson Water Subconservancy for roughly over 10 years on various projects and uh, everything dealing with conservation and flood management throughout the Carson River watershed portions of Story County. Projects we've worked with, Ed James and his team, I have benefited the entire region and as we are a contributor to some of the, uh, the flooding and seed uh, load and other matters for the Carson River. Uh, we've worked on annual noxious weed programs and revegetation. We've worked on 2D modeling and flood planning uh, in coordination with adjacent Lyon County, as well as the other participating counties in the district. We've worked on LIDAR and mapping and other flood planning, uh, both for Virginia City, Gold Hill, and Mark Twain and American Flat. Um, they have helped us with uh, national flood insurance program compliance and the community rating system and also education and outreach uh, through both K through 12 schools, as well as our other citizens. Uh, everything we do with them is of uh, regional importance. The bill enables us to have long-term planning and coordination with the communities and our uh, environmental, natural environment. Uh, we wanna uh, thank Ed James and his team for everything they do for us, and we hope that we do as much for them as well. Uh, Story County supports Senate Bill 98. Thank you very much. Caller with the last three digits, three, two, three. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Good afternoon, Chairman and Committee. My name is Steve Walker, S-T-E-V-W-A-L-K-E-R. I'm representing Carson, Lyon, Story, and Douglas counties, uh, with the exception of Churchill, all the counties within Nevada, within the watershed. I would like to thank Senator Settlemeyer for sponsoring the bill. I'm speaking in support. Uh, it is uh, important that all the acreage within the watershed, the Story County portion, be included. I'd also like to add some clarity to Senator Brooks' question. The actual Marlette system has three basins. Marlette Lake is in Tahoe. Over the hill of Hobart is in the Franktown drainage into the Truckee. And then the piping goes over the hill into to Story County, uh, which would drain into the Truckee. But also potable water goes down the road into Silver, into, um, <coughs> Silver City. So it does go as potable water that's delivered through uh, three watersheds. With that, uh, I would, again, please support the bill. Uh, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. As a reminder, we are currently on support testimony on Senate Bill 98. If you have recently joined the call and would like to testify in support, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no more callers in support at this time. Great, thank you. Uh, BPS, is there anyone on the line wishing to provide testimony in opposition to SB 98? Thank you, Chair. To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 98, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Great, thank you. And last but not least, is uh, BPS, is there anyone wishing to testify in neutral on SB 98? Thank you, Chair. To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 98, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in neutral at this time. Great, thank you. Uh, are there any last minute remarks? Uh, Senator Sotomayor, did you want to say anything else? Uh, go for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to present at Senate Bill 98 today, and I look forward to being able to address any concerns or issues that you or any member of your committee that wish to bring forward or that you wish addressed. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, great. 
So um, uh, at this time, I will go ahead and close the hearing on SB 98. 98. Uh, we will not be taking any action on any bills today, but we will bring them back for future work sessions. So at this time, uh, thank you, sir. And let's go ahead and proceed with back to the beginning of this. So uh, let's go ahead and begin our next bill hearing. I will now open the hearing on SB 63. This measure revises provisions relating to hemp. Will the bill presenter, Ms. Ashley Jepson, Administrator of the Division of Plant Industry, State Department of Agriculture, please proceed when you are ready. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee for the opportunity to present Senate Bill 63. Um, I'll just provide a, a brief background on, on how this program works that provides a little bit of context as to why we're putting this bill forward. Um, a, a key piece here is that hemp has to be, it has to be registered. Um, so our Department of Agriculture oversees this piece. And the key reasoning behind that is that um, the thing that distinguishes it from marijuana has to be done through chemical analysis. So um, the, that's why the Department of Ag, we, we take in registrations, we perform crop sampling and all those things in, in cooperation with USDA to make sure that these hemp facilities are truly hemp as federally defined. Um, so as I mentioned, annually we're taking in applications, we're performing inspections, um, making sure that we know where the hemp plants are, that all the criteria on their application meets federal expectations. And then of course the crop sampling, every single crop, every variety needs to be sampled and tested and to make sure that it is not marijuana. Um, so with that, the, the key thing we're really trying to do with this bill is to update with federal regulations. There are a couple additional changes that we have mainly for um, ease of implementation of the program, um, specific to the deadline that we have put in place. Um, also just trying to modernize and provide transparency as to what we um, need to do for this program. And um, a key thing that we're trying to do is you know, folks that are involved in this industry, that they can take a look at these statutes and, and understand what the expectations are. And some of that is cleanup of language. And again, folding in some of those codes of federal regulations. So with that, um, section one um, really is updating that deadline. So we have specified here a deadline of July 1st. Um, that's new and that's really for ease of our program staff to be able to handle um, the application reviews prior to peak harvest season. Um, our applications are based on a calendar year, so they expire um, December 31st, and we start to take in those applications right around then, beginning of the year. The problem being, sometimes we, we continue to get applications in the midsummer, and that's really you know, August, um, September, October, November through December are the times that we need to be available out in the field to sample. Um, so we're requesting the July 1st deadline to allow our staff to prioritize in being available to get out in the field quickly and take those crop samples. Um, just um, for a little bit of context, the, the timing for crop sampling is incredibly critical. The uh, THC can continue to spike depending on environmental factors and as the crop matures. So when growers indicate that they're getting close to harvest and they need us out there, we want to be able to do that. So that's our intent there. Section two, um, this is updating uh, to reflect Code of Federal Regulations. Sampling um, per uh, new federal regulations must be performed by the State Department of Agriculture that's working in conjunction with them. So we wanted initially when these, um, when this NRS was put forward, that wasn't specified. And we wanted to have flexibility in the event that there could be other opportunity for sampling, but being that it's been uh, very clearly must be the State Department of Ag, we're including that language to make sure that we remain compliant. Um, section, uh, this, excuse me, this section two also just specifies that we need to provide a report of analysis to those producers, meaning when we're taking those samples that we're actually giving them what their uh, THC levels are because they need that in order to sell their crop. So again, some of that's clarifying what, what expectations are from both sides and making that very clear. And that's also um, a requirement of USDA for state departments of ag that have that primary regulatory oversight. Section three is em emphasizing on falsification of information on their application. Um, the falsification, if, if there is any falsification in an application, especially intentional, of course, um, 
CFR requires that we do not accept those applications and we deny them. Um, so we're including that language. And um, in addition to that, there's some language pertaining to compliance with local and federal or local um, government requirements. So that's been really heavily geared around um, as part of our application, we do ask folks, are you have you made sure that your zoning is appropriate for, for production or handling? Have you gotten the appropriate water rights? Um, and in the past, it's been a check yes or no type of a thing. And we have been um, inundated with complaints from county commissioners from our state water authority with misuse of land and water. And as you can imagine, especially with some of our drought conditions, this is of particular concern. So we're trying to get ahead of it so that we're making sure that you know, you need to, if you're applying for hemp production, these are things you need to be um, pursuing so that they're not then getting a license. And then after the fact, um, there's repercussions for not meeting those other expectations. It's much better to do it beforehand. And we're trying to work um, closely with our other agencies to help that happen. Um, I think those are the key changes. So I'll just reiterate, um, trying to get our statutes in par with um, federal requirements as we must demonstrate that in order to continue to have a state program. With that, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jepson, for your time and for that presentation. At this time, do any of my committee members have any questions? Let's go first with uh, Senator Gorkachia. Uh Senator, you are muted. I can hear you. Uh, Am I on? Yep, you're good. Thank you, uh, Chair Donati. Uh, just a couple questions. Uh, it, it says here that uh, you're going to, uh, you know, the department shall collect and sample the crop. Now, but then it also allows that uh, the grower can have the sample tested at an independent cannabis testing lab. Now, who collects that uh, that test uh, or that sample, uh, Ms. Jepson? That's a great question for the record, Ashley Jepson. Um, so at this point in time, um, it ha all samples, um, regardless of where they would be analyzed, would have to be performed by the Department of Ag, and that's a federal requirement. Um, it, it specifies that the, the private labs have to be approved by the department in order to provide that service. And at this point in time, we have not authorized any third party labs um, just for making sure that there's, um, we're trying to make sure that there's uh, no conflicts and so forth and that things are done consistently. So at this time we're, we're doing all sample analysis within our agency. With that, we do encourage uh, growers to, to utilize private labs so they can I should have specified this, I apologize. They can um, send a sample to a private lab to have analyzed just to get an indication of where their THC levels are, but the Department of Ag performs the, the testing and sampling for the compliance um, the compliance piece. So um, they can, during the season, if they wanna see where their THC levels are at so that they time it right with us, they can absolutely do that with private labs. But ultimately, the, the compliancy is done with us, and that's the certificate of analysis that we give is what they would need to use to sell their product. I'm happy to clarify if I muddied that up too much. <laughs> no, no, I, I think I know where you, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may. Uh, now, have we got all the regulations in place uh, to the department may adopt regulations relating to the testing? So do you have all the regs in place, uh, Ms. Jepson? For the record, Ashley Jepson, yes, we actually, um, we went through a temporary regulation um, adoption phase just to get us through um, until we can get past the legislative session when the legislative commission reconvenes. So we do have all the regulations in place that we've, um, that USDA has indicated we need in place for them to approve our state plans. So we have primary regulatory oversight. Um, we're doing that through temporary regulation and we'll pursue full adoption at the conclusion of the legislative session when legislative commission reconvenes. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just, you know, we did have some problems last year, which I don't have to tell you, uh, you know, on the testing, the 30 day requirement. Uh, do you feel you have the staff and 
uh, enough personnel in place to, I know our hemp production is down considerably this year compared to what it's been, was a year ago or even two years ago. But, uh, you know, that, that was a real issue when they called you and it, it was a week before you showed up to cut the test and another week turnaround. And, uh, and at that point, I think we were running on a 15 day window. The 30 day window now will help. But uh, again, I'm just concerned that, uh, you know, some of these guys got millions of dollars invested in that, uh, the, the larger ones out there, Silver Lion or whatever. And if you're talking, like, talking a million dollar crop and you fail to get there to test it and they can't meet the guidelines, uh, it's huge. So th thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Jepson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Of course. Thank you, Senator, for that um, clarification. Uh, does anyone else have any other questions? Mr. Hansen? Uh, Senator Hansen, go. Go for it. Thanks, Chair. I, I'm, uh, I cannot remember all the details from last session when we talked about hemp. What is the bulk of this hemp used for? And it, is it still, I mean, put it bluntly, I mean, if you smoke the stuff, you get high. Uh, and in the absence of that, what are they using the bulk of the hemp crop for? For the record, Ashley Jepson, that's a great question. Um, what we've seen at this point, uh, most folks are using it for CBD oil. Um, so as part of these new federal regulations, they did clarify definition. So it, it means extracts and derivatives. So if um, a manufacturer is trying to concentrate some of the, the crop um, and trying to create oils, concentrated forms that could concentrate the THC levels, that end product is regulated as well. So they're supposed to be under that 0.3% THC as established by federal law. And the whole intent is if it's sold with that, that it shouldn't be psychoactive. Um, so, so that's how it's structured at this point in time. But yes, most are using it for CBD oil, which then is going into a number of other products. Very few are using it for industrial uh, purposes. There are a few though. Okay, and out of curiosity, what? how large was the crop in Nevada? Apparently Senator Gokichi indicates that it's down substantially. How big was the crop at its peak in the last couple of years? For the record, Ashley Jepson. So um, for context, in 2018, we had about 115 registered producers. Uh, 2019, we had 216. And then in 2020, it dropped back down to 116. Um, if you give me a second, I have all the stats. I just don't have them right on my, on my table with me, but I'm happy to send those as well. Our, our production acreage is, is still higher than it was in 2018, but I think it's roughly about a third of what it was last year, but I, I'm happy to provide um, those statistics to the committee so you can see it. Firsthand. Well, that's okay on my part. I'm, I'm more curious than anything, so don't, don't, no reason to waste a lot of your staff time. But thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Uh, I have a quick question just for clarification purposes. Uh, Ms. Jepson, can you walk me through the process of uh, once a department has determined that something has been falsified or that um, you might pursue suspending or revoking the registration of something. Can you walk me through, is there an appeal process that can go into that? Like what, how does this process go for uh, on both sides? For the record, Ashley Jepson, yes, there is an appeal process. So if we found that somebody had falsified information, um, they would receive a denial letter as to why and um, a notice of hearing, especially if a certificate had already been issued and it was found after the fact, they would be issued a notice of hearing where they would have opportunity to, to plead their case. Um, and then if the conclusions are still that they falsified the information and the denial or revocation is going to move forward, they can appeal it there and then um, move forward with court. And, and just for clarification, who is the one that reviews the uh, who is the one that reviews that process, uh, the the appeal that would that would be filed? For the record, Ashley Jepson. So our uh, deputy attorney general will serve the notice of hearing, and the hearing officer is established in statute and is our deputy director. And again, if their conclusions are that you know they do conclude that they had the violation, then it can move forward with district court. Great, thank you, ma'am. Uh, anyone else have any other further questions at this time? Senator Gorgachia, go for it. Just a comment more than anything, uh, Senator Hansen was 
questioning uh, the other uses of it, but uh, we do have a bill coming forward. We hope to expand the industrial uses of Camp in Nevada to establish a, a better marketplace, uh, more of a, a wider, broader market. Uh, thank you, Senator Gorgachev, for that comment and clarification. Okay, uh, I don't think we see any other questions, so we are ready, ready to move forward. Um, as a reminder, we will be limiting all testifiers to two minutes each. Testifiers are encouraged to summarize their positions and submit more comprehensive testimony in writing. BPS, is there anyone on the line who would wish to provide uh, support testimony at this time? Thank you, Chair. To testify in support on Senate Bill 63, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in support at this time. Great, thank you. Um, next, we will go ahead and hear a testimony in opposition. Thank you, Chair. To testify in opposition on Senate Bill 63, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no callers in opposition at this time. Thank you. And then last but not least, uh, finally, is there anyone wishing to testify in neutral of the bill? Thank you, Chair. To testify in neutral on Senate Bill 63, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Caller with the last three digits, 260. Please slowly state and spell your name for the record. You will have two minutes and may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. My name is Chris Rusby. That is spelled C-H-R-I-S. Last name Rusby, R-U-S, B as in boy, Y. I speak on on behalf of Battleborn Biologics, a licensed hemp grower, as well as Western States Hemp, another licensed hemp grower. And looking over this bill, I, I would like to, to see if we can add one other thing in there right now. Uh, as of right now, NRS 557.240 subsection 2 uh, only allows for crops that have failed to be disposed of. Recently, the USDA revised its interim final regulations, which was a major step to allow for crops that have failed to be remediated or to be repurposed so as to prevent a total loss. I believe that we need to include language in this bill to allow that same um, process to apply for crops here in Nevada. Uh, this has been an, an issue that has cost people significant amounts of money. And I believe that to be consistent and not more strict than federal law requires and to allow Nevada to adequately be able to compete in this industry against other more uh, agricultural powerhouse states that we also need to have a flexible approach that allows remediation of failed crops as opposed to a strict uh, disposal requirement. And I would also like to comment on the uh, section one of SB 366 with the July 1st deadline. I do understand the department's uh, concerns and need for that However, that would be an approach that is different from other states. It would put, potentially put Nevada at a competitive disadvantage if there are other people who are entering or, or establishing new sites, uh, that having that deadline uh, may be problematic. And I think that we might want to reconsider that for as 
to eliminating the deadline. There are many states that, that don't have any deadline like that. And that is all the, the comments that I have. Thank you. As a reminder, we are currently on neutral testimony on Senate Bill 63. If you have recently joined the call and would like to testify in neutral, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, there are no more callers in neutral at this time. Thank you, BPS, for that. Uh, Ms. Jepson, do you have any other final remarks that you'd like to include? For the record, Ashley Jepson, I appreciate the opportunity to present this bill, and I, I will um, mention our intent also is to allow for the new provisions for remediation of crop. This is a, a new addition that um, the final rules will allow us, uh, fed final federal rules will allow us to apply. Um, we adopted CFR by reference in our um, latest regulations, so it will allow remediation, but I would agree that it, this would be a good opportunity to clarify that language here as well, being that um, that new information is available. So we're happy to work with um, the committee or any other members to resolve any issues and to work on an amendment as needed. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Jepson, for that clarification, and I appreciate your time today. Again, uh, just for everyone that is out there in the public, as I mentioned uh, with the other bill, we will not be taking any actions on these bills today but we may bring them back for a future work session. Great, thank you. Uh, at this time, I will go ahead and uh, move on to the introduction of committee BDRs. So this is in continuation of the BDRs that we have been receiving from the interim committee. So committee members, as you know, pursuant to joint standing rule 14, a majority of the members of the committee must vote to introduce legislation on behalf of the committee. As noted on in our committee rule six, committee introductions may be for accommodation only and is not to be considered construed as approval of a measure. Joint standing rule 14 requires that certain measures be introduced by a standing committee. And among those measures are those requested by statutory committees and interim legislative studies. Today, we only have one BDR that was requested by the Legislative Committee on Public Lands. Um, before I read about the EDR, I just wanna go back. I believe uh, I forgot to close the hearing on SB 663. So I just wanna make sure that that's reflected on the record. Okay, uh, so going back onto the introduction on committee BDRs. Um, so again, uh, as noted, this is uh, for accommodation only and is not to be construed as approval of a measure. The BDR that we have at this moment is BDR 48471. Uh, this BDR revises provisions relating to the Division of Water Resources of the State Department of Conservation and Natural Resources. With that, uh, I will take a motion to approve the introduction of BDR 48471. So moved. This is Vice Chair Scheibel. Thank you, Senator Scheibel, Vice Chair Scheibel. Um, so, uh, motion to approve by uh, Senator Scheibel. Um, and do I have a second? Second, Brooks. Uh, seconded by Senator Brooks. Uh, is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, uh, will the committee secretary please take a roll call vote? Senator Brooks. Yes. Senator Goikachia. Yes. Senator Hansen. Yes. Senator Scheibel. Yes. Chair Donate. And I am a yes. Thank you. Uh, the motion passes and this bill will now be introduced. Great. Thank you all uh, for this time. So at this time, we can go ahead and move on to public comment. I will not call for public comment. Please remember to limit your comments to two minutes each. Uh, BPS staff, is there anyone uh, who would wish to provide public comment? Thank you, Chair. We are currently on public comment. If you have recently joined the call and would like to participate in public comment, please press star nine now to take your place in the queue. Chair, the public line is open and working. There are no callers at this time. Let's give it uh, a few more seconds just to 
uh, in case if there's a lag. Certainly, Chair. Thank you. Standing by. Chair, the public line is open and working, and there are no callers at this time. Thank you for that, BPS. Great. Um, at this time, do I have any last minute comments before we adjourn from any of my committee members? Seeing none. So our next meeting is on Tuesday, March 2nd at 3.30 p.m. The agenda is actually just posted for that. We'll be hearing SB 125. And we'll be having a work session on SB33, SB43, and SB53. So with that, uh, this meeting is now adjourned. Thank you.